opening day 2024. Dad, my Hall of Fame baseball writer dad, and myself, little old Jeff Kirkshin, Tim Kirkshin, we're finally doing our podcast together, and no better day of the year than to release it than on opening day. Right. It's a national holiday in this country. It was certainly a holiday in our house growing up. Jeff, parents take their children out of school for opening day. Yeah, That's how important it is. It means that summertime is coming, vacations are coming. It's the greatest day of the year, and it's also opening day for our podcast, Is This a Great Game or What? Now, which is named after your second of three books. And I'm really glad we went with this one, not I'm Fascinated by <laughs> Sacrifice Flies, the podcast. Right. Agreed. Now, this this podcast is going to drop every week. Did I use that verb properly? Drops on Tuesday. Is that right? I'll get, yeah. The I mean, lingo, that's right. I'm way behind on the lingo. That is on the lingo. All that's right. correct. It's going to drop every Tuesday. There is no heavy lifting here. Right. There's not going to be screaming back and forth. We're not going to be breaking a whole lot of stories on a weekly show. It is going to be a joyous playful, fun podcast. We're going to have a guest every week. Our first guest is our dear friend, yep. Eduardo Perez of ESPN, who told a story I'd never heard. I've known him for 25 years, that when he was a kid, when he, was a kid he used to serve beers to Johnny Bench and Pete Rose out of a keg in the Reds clubhouse when he was 13 years old. I just say, in comparison, I think Eddie won the lottery when it came to baseball dads. He has a Hall of Fame baseball player dad. He played Major League Baseball. And I love you, but I got the dinky sports writer <laughs> side of the baseball right, dads. And, and let's be clear <laughs> about the Hall of Fame stuff here, Jeff. They're the players. I'm just a writer, and that's how this works. But, but I have to brag about you and say, in 2022, you were enshrined in Cooperstown under the baseball writer section of the Hall of Fame. And, Dad, look at it like this. Yeah, okay, we were not blessed with the height. Or <laughs> you've got great hands and great athletic ability, but your two brothers are the real athletes in the family. You took what you were born with, which is an art form of telling stories, and you made it into a Hall of Fame career. I'm so proud of you. You are you are my personal and my professional hero, and I mean that from the way we were raised. I always wanted to be a dad, which I have a six-month-old who we currently have the baby monitor <laughs> in the background of the podcast. It's so. a relationship show. <laughs> And you taught me how to be a dad. You taught me how to be a storyteller. And so to be able to do this podcast with you, it's my dream come true. I, I don't want to get choked up, but it really is special. Right. And we knew from a very early age that Jeffrey Kirkchen was not going to follow in his dad's footsteps as a baseball writer, which is okay. You were watching Whose Line Is It Anyway? <laughs> when you were seven years old, you were preparing for your career, and now you are an accomplished morning radio show host, country music talk in Philadelphia. So we're going to have some music talk while we're on here, even though it's obvious <laughs> that I don't know anything about music. I've made that abundantly clear. I've been to three concerts in my entire life, and I'm 67 years old. But there's going to be a bit of a crossover there. But help me with this, Jeff, from the start. You told me the other day that Ed Sheeran is Mike Trout. Now, now quickly explain how Mike Trout and Ed Sheeran are the same in the history of sports and music. You have to understand, when I talk to you about anything that's not baseball related, it's like comparing, you have to talk to a child, right? I have to compare it in terms that you can understand. So when I say that Ed Sheeran is the Mike Trout of music, he writes music, he performs, he puts out albums, he's that good. So he's a five-tool singer is what you're saying. Absolutely. 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 So this is uh, obviously, we got to get back to the most important part of today, which is the holiday that is opening day. And we have a lot, we have 26 weeks of the baseball season in order to talk about all of the crap that we want to get into as well as the music industry and whatever it might be. But it, it's about opening day today. Right. But before we get there, I want to explain what this whole podcast is about. Is this a great game or yes. what? This whole podcast is a tribute to my father, Jeff, your grandfather. And we named you after my father. 
the second book I wrote is called Is This a Great Game or What? Because my dad had the greatest feel for baseball. He loved the sport. He was a really good player. And the number of times I watched him, like, slap his forehead when something in baseball would happen, he'd look at me and go, is this a great game or what? That is the reason that I wrote that book. He is the reason that we have a podcast. And there is my dad up there holding Jeffrey Kirkchen. I think you're about 18 years old in that. <laughs> you were a very small child, as, yeah. and I was even smaller than you at that age. But that's the point of this. And again, this is going to be a fun, playful podcast that we're going to do 26 weeks during the regular season. I can't wait. As mentioned before, Eduardo Perez, former major leaguer, current ESPN baseball analyst, is going to join us to give his take on opening day. I can't wait to talk to a former player and the son of a former player. So he's been in dugouts and around baseball his entire life, similar to a certain degree of the way I grew up in a baseball household. Opening day is a holiday. Let's get your kind of quick hits. <laughs> quick hits here on your favorite opening day stories after covering the game for 170 right. years. Right. Well, I have, a, I have a million of them, Jeff. I'm going to personalize a couple of these because that's what makes uh, opening day so special. 2017, I went to Stephen Vogt, who's now the manager of the Guardians. He was the, the primary catcher for the Oakland A's at the time. And if we had a talent show in baseball, he would win every time. Like you, he can sing he can dance he can play the piano he can do anything but Unlike i can't me, hit, i can't hit a 98 uh, mile per hour well, well neither can i <laughs> well aware so on opening day of 2017 i go to steven Vogt. we're doing the game eduardo perez car ravage and myself we're doing the game from the booth and i say steven could you tape something for me before the game that we can play before your first at bat can you give us something great like can you give us the in a van down by the river skit from Saturday Night Live. Trust me, Jeff, I've seen this. Nobody, but nobody does it better. I'm Matt Foley, <laughs> thrice divorced and living in a van down by the river. Sorry, I had, so to, I had to go there. So Stephen Vogt says, I can't do that. That's just for my teammates. So he says, but I'll sing for you. So on three hours before the first pitch on opening day, in full uniform, he sings three three. Disney songs for me. It was un including something from um, The Little, Little Mermaid, Mermaid right? which was, yes. Which I was remember this. So we play the clip of The Little Mermaid before his first at bat. And in his first at bat, seconds later, he, he hits a home run. It was unbelievable. It was like <laughs> from under the sea to over the fence. It was <laughs> It was like from aerial to aerial. It was unbelievable. Those are the moments that have no importance in baseball history. But how can that not be unforgettable when a guy sings you a song about a mermaid and then he hits a home run a few seconds later? You mentioned baseball history. I want to get to the most important in the history of the game opening days. But I'm sure you have more personal stories of your favorite opening days. Yeah, a couple years ago, Joey Votto was playing for the Reds. Future Hall of Famer Joey Votto. What a character he uh, is. Right. Oh, too. my gosh. On my way to Atlanta for opening day to do the game with Ravi, Eduardo, David Cohn, I unearthed that Joey Votto has never popped out to the pitcher in his career. Now, I understand it's hard to pop out to the pitcher. It doesn't happen very often, but not once in 15 years. And I'm actually thinking to myself on the way to Atlanta, wouldn't this would be great if I'm doing a game and Joey Votto pops out to the pitcher on opening day. What are the chances? Zero percent chance. So six inning rolls around and he hits a foul pop up. The pitcher runs over and catches it. And I am now hyperventilating. I'm in the dugout. I'm absolutely going berserk. I'm apoplectic because this is exactly what I had prayed for. Look, it's pathetic, Jeff, that I knew that he never popped out to the pitcher. It's even more pathetic that I was that excited that he did. So I, I got on with Ravi from the booth and I explained the whole how this has never happened before. And my voice is completely out of control. I sound like I'm 10 years old. And Ravi looks at Cody, who hadn't worked much with me and said, Tim gets a little excited. And when he does, his voice tends to go up. So <laughs> Stephen Vogt, Joey Votto, two of my favorite things. Not to divert too much, but you, you mentioned your voice. And uh, we have a lot of similarities. And it's so funny. I, I host a country morning show in Philadelphia on 92.5 XTU. And, and when mostly, you know, men figure out that I'm Tim Kirkshin's son, they go, 
Oh my gosh, that's what it is. They'll listen to my show in Philly and think, I've heard this before, but I don't know I don't know who Jeff is. He's a new guy on the air. And they say, oh, it makes sense that you're Tim Kirkshin's son. All right, the voices are terrible. Right. Mine is awful. <laughs> Yours is almost as bad, but that's not the point. We are providing content here and stories also. So my in spring training of 1982, this is my first year as a full-time, yeah. full-time beat writer and with the Dallas Morning News. The Rangers, my team, are playing in Cleveland. And just a couple weeks before spring, uh, before the opener, Mickey Rivers, the mischievous center fielder for the Rangers, comes up to me. I'd known him for three weeks in my life. And he goes, Tim, can you loan me $2,000? I said, oh, no. Mickey, I'm making $14,000 a year. I don't have $2,000 Period. Buddy Bell, also of the Rangers, comes up to me and says, whatever you do, don't loan Mickey any money. You'll never see it again. I think Mickey had a bit of a gambling issue. Not the point. The point is, <laughs> on opening day of 1982, the rookie center fielder for the Rangers, George Wright, went three for four. Rangers win eight to three. I go to George right after the game and say, George, did, did you have a good time today? And he goes, yeah, I've never been to a major league game before. Stop it. Yes. So... The first major league game he'd ever attended, he got three hits. Think about that. And then I just heard this story recently that Mickey Rivers, who loved George Wright and wanted him to make the team, faked an, an injury, faked a hamstring injury and said, I can't play. You got to put me on the DL for opening day. That's how George Wright ended up on the team. That's how George Wright's career began is that Mickey faked an injury and George Wright went out and got three hits in the only major league game he'd ever attended. The That's the beauty of opening day. And most people in their first major league game are like, I downed three soft serves <laughs> and he got three hits. He got three hits. <laughs> It's a little, bit, little bit different there. Yes. All right. So we've talked your person. I know you could go on for hours on your favorite opening day stories because you have attended quite a few yourself. But I want to talk more kind of the, I guess, the perspective of your historical knowledge of the game. Biggest opening days in the history of the game. Well, I'm not sure there's a way around 1947. Jackie Robinson debuted with the Dodgers and changed the game by breaking the color barrier. That has to be number one. And I think, Dad, you know, this is our first episode of the podcast, but week by week, we're going to kind of have a theme, I guess you could say, and and definitely during Jackie Robinson Day, Major League Baseball, we really got to dedicate a little more time to the impact of that. It Not to be nerdy, but I, I took a lot of courses in college about the impact of African-American politics and the civil rights movement and how big Jackie Robinson breaking the color barrier was not just for baseball, but for the country. I want to get more into that, but you're right. That's probably the number one most important opening day. Right. And number two is 1974. I was a senior in high school and Hank Aaron is going for home run number 715 to pass Babe Ruth as the all-time home run hitter. So the backstory is that the Braves, Hank's team, had determined he wasn't going to play the first three games of the season in Cincinnati because they wanted him to hit 714 and 715 at home. So Ooh. he entered the season at 713, right. one shy of Babe Ruth's record. Right. And they were going to sit him out, and Bowie Kuhn, the commissioner of baseball, said, no, 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 he's <laughs> playing. So... On opening day that year, he had a home run off of Jack Billingham to hit number 714. They go back to Atlanta, still at 714. And Hank Aaron, while I'm watching the game with my dad, your grandfather, my two brothers in the living room on Stoneham Road, he hits number 715. It was an unforgettable moment. And the backstory there is that Tom House was a relief pitcher for the Braves. And all the relievers got spots where they were allowed to line up behind the, the center field fence by seniority in case they were able to catch number 715. So they could say, right, I was I, the one who caught it. Right. So Cecil Upshaw, their most veteran reliever, got right down the left field line because Hank tend to hook the ball. Tom House got the last pick. He was way out in left center field and he said, I didn't think there was any chance it was coming to me. And then he told me years later, <laughs> the ball goes up and Tom House never even moved and <laughs> caught it right here. And he had the last pick. He had the location. last pick. Then he ran the ball in and when he got to home plate, Hank Aaron was on home plate and he was crying at home plate because the pressure was off. He had passed Babe Ruth and he was the all-time 
home run hitter. That's incredible. And you remember watching that as a kid. That's, oh, yeah. And you that, were, let's see, I was, I was 18? I was 17 years old. Yeah. yeah. So wow. the, the following year, 1975, Frank Robinson was the Indians manager, and he's the first African-American manager in baseball history starting that day. He was also a player manager, and but he didn't put himself in the lineup on the first day. So Phil Seggy, his general manager, came down and said, Frank, you got to play today. This is your day. So reluctantly, he put himself in number two in the order for the Indians. He comes up in the first inning, and Doc Medich, a pitcher for the Yankees, 73,000 people watching this game, gets ahead 0-2 on Frank Robinson and then throws him this filthy slider just missing off the outside part of the plate, and Frank takes it for ball one. And Frank told me years later, he started thinking, he goes, this son of a bitch is trying to strike me out on three pitches on my day. Nobody does that to me. And he ne- hit the next pitch over the left center field fence for a home run. And that is Frank Robinson. And to finish the history lesson, 1926, Eddie Rommel faced Walter Johnson, who was the greatest pitcher in the history of the game. And they both pitched on opening day, and Walter Johnson won one to nothing, and both pitchers went 15 innings. And Walter Johnson was 38 years old when he pitched a one nothing shutout in 15 innings on opening day. You're hard-pressed to get a pitcher pitching six, six innings, innings these Look, days. Look, if anyone Wait. pitches a, a complete game on opening day today, I will give you $1,000. He went 15. 15 innings at age 38. Let me read your mind. What were you going to say next? Tell me I'm wrong. Were you going to say, guess where I went to high school, Jeff? Walter well, Johnson High School in Bethesda, Maryland. Well, this proves that I went to Walter Johnson High School. I have. Sweatshirt. Right. And let's see how well you know my life, Jeff. What What was the name of the school paper? The pitch. Uh, what was the name of the What was the name of the of the yearbook? The wind up. Yeah. <laughs> any, any chance, listen, and, and this is the funny part about the podcast, and, and you'll take through this journey. A lot of these stories are new to me. I mean that. And it's, I love being a student of the game and listening to these history lessons. But a lot of them I could definitely probably finish for you, especially when it comes to the wind-up. I, I, t- <laughs> I, I, I tend to repeat myself once in a while, Jeff, but we oh, have but a new have, audience. You we have, have new- great stories, and you should repeat your best stories for this podcast. All Absolutely. Right. Okay, yeah. so Walter Johnson, history of the game. And I think you're leaving out one Massive opening day of all time, which would be the only no hitter on right. an opening day. Right. Bob Feller of the Indians, who was Pop's all time favorite pitcher, told me he's the greatest pitcher I've ever seen. He pitched a no hitter on opening day. It's the only time in Major League history that a pitcher has thrown a no hitter on opening day. And if you believe that everyone's on. Uh, you know, average before the game is zero zero zero. It's the only game in major league history where everyone's average after the game was the same as it was before the game. Zero zero zero. So that's where Bob Feller ranks in baseball history. Only guy to do that. Eduardo Perez is going to be joining us to give his take. I'm really excited to get talking with him. But to wrap up our well, we're going to talk opening day with him, of course. But to wrap up just you and I on opening day, do you have any quirk gins that you yeah, want to all right, share? Let's be clear. We're going to have quirk gins on every episode of this podcast. Right. Quirk gins are just the funny things, the quirky things that I love to come up with. I've been doing this literally since I was seven years old. Now I'm 67 and I'm still doing it. A quirk gin, for instance, this is a very small one. Prince Fielder and his dad, Cecil Fielder finish their careers with exactly 319 home runs. What? Jeff, that's impossible that that could happen. So a couple of questions for opening day. Four different players have hit three home runs on opening day. Tuffy Rhodes, Matt Davidson, Dimitri Young, and George Bell. Now, Jeff, I know you don't know much about baseball, but seriously, have you ever heard of any of those four guys. Well, I'll tell you right now, Tuffy Rhodes sounds like a character in the Cars series <laughs> from Disney Pixar. So no, I haven't heard of a Tuffy Rhodes. But I'm guessing he played in 1891 or no? no? Tuffy Rhodes did this in 1994. <laughs> no, get this, Jeff. He had five career homers entering opening day, and he hit three in one game against Dwight Gooden, who was close to being the most dominant pitcher in baseball Wait, at the time. Revisit. 
five home runs for his entire career, career. leading and up to that opening Then he hit three in one game, and he finished his career with 12 home runs, but three of them came on opening day. This is why it's so beautiful. Now, the record, another <laughs> quirk, Jim, that only I love for most home runs by a player on opening day is not one opening day. That would be a record. Is eight. Ken Griffey Jr., Frank Robinson, Adam Dunn all hit eight homers on opening day in their wow. careers. And yet, and yet, uh, Johnny Bench hit 389 homers and never hit a home run on opening day. He's a Hall of Famer. Adrian Beltrade, our newest Hall of Famer, 477 homers, none on opening day. Madison Bumgarner, a pitcher, hit two homers on opening day. He's the only pitcher ever to do that. But Adrian Beltre never did. And then, and then in the early 2000s, the Mets had a little infielder named Kaz Matsui yeah. who hit the first pitch that he saw that season, of course, on opening day for a home run. And the next season, he hit the first pitch that he saw of the season for a home run. Only man ever did a home run on the first pitch he saw on opening day Two years in a row, and just did he to, follow it up the next year. The next no? year, he next wa season? he was hurt. The next year, he wasn't active on opening day. But in his first game back, which was like April twenty first, he had a home run no. in his first at bat. Not not first, not first pitch, but still three years in a bat. row. Three years in a row, he had a home run in his first at bat of the season. Two of those were on the first pitch. And just to show you again, Jeff, how pathetic I am. I did a note for Sports Illustrated, you know, early 90s, mid-90s, Ron Karkovice, catcher for the White Sox, went 0 for 5 with five strikeouts in one game. And I checked. He's the only player ever to go 0 for 5 with five strikeouts in one game. So I checked every year for almost 30 years to find the next guy to do it. And last year, 2023, Max Muncy of the Dodgers. My money was either on Max Muncy or Kyle Schwarber. I wasn't sure which one was going to do it. Max Muncy <laughs> went 0 for 5 with five strikeouts on opening day. And Jeff, again, I woke up at, you know, uh, 6 o'clock in the morning as always, drank a Diet Mountain Dew and devoured the box scores, which is what I do every single day of my life. And there was his biggest day. 0 for 5 with 5 strikeouts. It was like the greatest morning of my entire life that this had actually happened again when I checked it every opening day for 30 years. Is this a great game or what? With Tim and Jeff Kirkshin welcoming our guest today is Eduardo Perez. Good morning, afternoon, day, whatever it is your time, Eddie. Thank you for joining us for our opening day podcast. Welcome. I want my two partners. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like leading off this bad boy too. I'm so excited. Right. Well, Eddie's I'm glad not... we finally get some height on the podcast, Dad. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> right. Uh, we, we talked about this on the air once. Ravi wears, Carl Ravitch wears a seven and a half shoe. I wear a seven and a half shoe, and Eduardo wears a 15. So his, sh <laughs> his shoes are exactly the same size as twice his broadcast partner's shoes. That's what Eddie is up against, and it's an even smaller booth with me and Jeff. Jeff, tell me, tell me your shoe size is bigger. Please eight tell and, me. It's eight and a half, Eddie. It's not much bigger, but Good. it's there. But, Good. Eddie, you know, we share something in common. When I was, when I was in uh, just leaving college, I moved to Cleveland. Somebody stole my gym bag from the gym I was at. And I said, joke's on them. No one's going to be able to fit into my shoes. And you probably could have the same. <laughs> That's something we can share in common. <laughs> the, the, the big question is, that, did they return them, though? But yeah, they at least have the decency. They're like, we don't need these. <laughs> right. So, Jeff, as you know, Eduardo is the greatest teammate ever. He and I traveled for years together. We don't do it nearly as much anymore, which saddens me to no end. Let's just see how well Eduardo knows Tim and his travel issues. What is it, Eduardo, that makes me the happiest man in the world? Get there at least, I want to say, not even two hours, three hours before your flight takes off and you sit there and you're able to just be calm at the gate way before anybody, even the airplane, gets there. That's and number one. What is in my hand? Oh, the ticket. You print it out. <laughs> I mean, there is no digitalization whatsoever. And as a matter of fact, we were coming, I, I believe it was, from Phoenix, we had to stop in Dallas. In Dallas, we were going to go to Fort Myers. And everyone had their digital uh, um, 
you know, ticket to get in. And we got on our plane. They said there's a malfunction on the plane. We need to get off the plane. So please keep your tickets. And we don't know yet if it's going to work the digital side of it. And the only person there that had their ticket in hand <laughs> and that did not have to make the long line was Tim Kirchin. You know, that I, let me guess what my dad would have said. Eddie, I don't know if my Apple Air iPods are going to turn off right now, Eddie. That's why I have the ticket. Yes. And, but Jeff, you got to understand, Eduardo is the complete opposite of me. He told me once when we were in Bristol, 715 flight. He is leaving the hotel at 545 for a 750. He's got to drive a half an hour to the airport, turn in a rental car, get on a rental car bus, get in line, get through security, and then get on the plane. And he said, oh, plenty of time, hour and a half. That, that's all I need. He doesn't even need a boarding pass. He just walks on the plane because he acts like he's been there before. That's who Eduardo is. And, and let me add to that real quick. They messed up my mojo because now they took away the rental car bus, and now it's in the airport, and right. we can just go and walk through. So now I don't have to leave at 5.30. I can leave at 5.45. <laughs> right. And Eddie is unbelievable, but he's the one. I must tell you, he got me on TSA Pre. He got me in the clear. Now I have the cream and the clear, and and I I, I get through a lot easier. But I saw Eduardo once. He and I were going to miss a flight in Chicago, Jeff. It was hilarious. And there must have been 200 people in line. He said, follow me. He walks to the front of the line. He tells this woman, we're on TV. She has no idea who we are, nor should she. She said, he said, we're on TV. We have to get in right now. And she said, okay, come on in. It was unbelievable. <laughs> All because he acted like he's been there before. Amazing. What Eddie taught me. Eddie said, always just play it cool. We'll be fine. Don't worry. Don't stress about it. Right. I, didn't, didn't Eduardo Jeff get you into a, a then Indians playoff game just by following us in and you walked around with a, you know, no seat or anything? Wasn't that Eduardo that did that? It, it was, well, Eduardo also, when we had moved to Philadelphia, my wife and I, we wanted to go on the, the 4th of July game, which was like the 5th of July for some reason. And I, I reached out, and I, I knew you guys were calling the game. So I said, hey, you know, we want to go to the game. And Dad said, oh, well, yeah, we can see what we can do. Before I knew it, I got a text from Eddie. I got it handled. Don't worry about it. We figured it out. <laughs> Taken care of. Ed, Taken Eduardo care had of. already taken care of. Now, Eddie, I want to I wanna talk a little bit about opening day. But first, I want to get your take on Adrian Beltre's uh, election to the Hall of Fame. He'll he'll get officially into the Hall this summer, and uh, you're obviously very familiar with the Hall of Fame with your dad being a member of it uh, back in 2000, but he's now, I think it's the fourth Dominican player to be in, and this is really exciting to see more and more representation of these players uh, in the Hall of Fame. This is exciting. Yeah, it's really exciting. Look, I mean, to join the ranks of Juan Marichal and Pedro Martinez and, and Big Poppy David Ortiz. We know Albert Pujols is going to be joining that class and most likely might be getting 100% voting the way it looks. Um, you know, Adrian getting 95, and he was in shock of that. I don't know why he was because he was that type of player, uh, especially once he turned 30. It was like you're going to go to Texas to see what Adrian Beltre does not only at the plate, not only on defense, but also in the batter's box and at um, and, and in the, and the on-deck circle. And it's just to see a former teammate of mine, I played with him in Seattle in 2006 at the end of my career, and to see him excel from there once he got to uh, Texas after having that one-year stint in Boston, it played. It played, and it was exciting to see him uh, go out there and represent and and I, I was so proud of him. I was so proud of the way he answered the questions uh, after being uh, uh, after seeing the voting process and everything. And and um, I'm 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 excited for him. It's one of those Tim that you know that when because of Sunday night baseball and we do, and we do baseball tonight. Sometimes it's really hard and difficult to be able to be there on that Sunday for it. But um, I'm looking forward to maybe just going on Friday and Saturday and having to take off on on Sunday, depending where that game is, uh, to be able to see at least and, and share some time with him the same way I did with David Ortiz 
when he got inducted. Right, Eddie, he's one of the five greatest defensive third basemen that I've ever seen. And he told me that he never wore a cup. <laughs> and he played third base. Eddie, you're probably wearing a cup right now. How do you explain <laughs> that a guy could play third base his entire career without using a cup? I asked him once, how did you do that? He, he shows me his hands and he goes, that's what these are for. How is that? I can't help but think that when he was sitting in that sofa at the, and, and having the conversation about it, I looked to his left and I looked to his right. And he's got three kids, too. So, I mean, he had really good hands because there is no way, there is no way that you're going to pay me. There's not enough money to tell me that I have to go to play third and, and not wear a cup. And a quick story with that, and God bless her soul, my grandmother, um, my, you know, she passed in 1984, a long time. But I, I grew up, my first 13 years were privileged as when my parents would leave, I would actually stay with my grandparents and. And my grandmother taught me how to cook and everything. And one time I asked her, I said, Abuela, I need a cup. And in Spanish, it's una copa. And she goes, oh, honey, don't worry. We have a lot of those in the back. <laughs> and I'm like, what do you mean have a lot of cups in the back? I came from a baseball family. So I believed her. I'm, I'm gullible. I'm 11 years old at the time. And she goes, follow me. And then she had all this glassware over there. And it, she's like, what do you need it for? You're 11. And I'm like, for baseball, a cup, a banana cup. She's like. Oh, I don't know what that is. Yeah. So. And, and the last cup story goes to Kent Herbeck, who we all remember was a really great Minnesota twin. And when he retired, he told me he took his cup and nailed it up against, with a nail, in his garage, hanging up in his garage. That's the first thing he did after he retired. And I called him like 25 years later, and he told me that cup is still hanging in my garage. Oh. Love Ken Herbeck. Oh, wow. All right, Eduardo, your first opening day as a kid that you can remember that you went to with your dad and you're in uniform, not when you're three, but what's the first one that you can remember going to an opening day with Tony Perez, your father? Uniform. In uniform that I was there in the dugout was 1983 with the Philadelphia Phillies. It was the first time we were allowed in the clubhouse and in the better set in the dugout for the game. So that was really cool. But there's a story before that, you know, because in 1980, it was Pete Rose Jr. with Pete Rose. And it would be, you know, he would have Rose 14 on his back. And I'm like, man, I, that, I was so envious of that. In the meantime, in 1980, I was in Boston. We weren't allowed on the field, let alone in the clubhouse way before games and anything. So we get to the Phillies in 83, and I'm like, Dad, I can be in the, I can be in the dugout now. So my dad's like, I got a surprise for you. Shows up with a jersey, and in the back of the jersey, I'm thinking it's going to say Perez 24. I was so pumped. And it said, Bat Boy. I'm like, <laughs> what? Bat Boy? I'm like, try again. And I had to work the games for the first few weeks of the season. And every time I, I was a ball boy, and every time the umpire would say three, I had to have four balls just in case one was a foul ball, I'd give him four. If he said four, I have to have five in hand. And after a while, I was going nuts. I'm like, this isn't any fun. Unfortunately, yeah. I was able to then, they just said, you know what, just go sit down. Sit down, pay attention to the game. And I think it's the best thing that ever happened to me because – I ended up seeing the game in a completely different light around big leaguers during big league games. There's nothing like it. Right. Well, Tell us what Pete Rose told you in that in the dugout once. Okay. So I was playing seeds with John Denny and um, the pitcher. He was the number two pitcher for the Phillies that year. And, and we're flicking seeds and one of them flies over to Pete and hits him. And he snapped at me and, 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 you know, and he tells me, he's like, get over here right now, Ed. And sit here and watch the game and tell me what pitch is coming. And I'm like, I'm 13. I, I don't know what pitch is coming. I'm, I'm, I turned 14 September 11th. Wait a second. And he's like, you, you're going to tell me because you're going to watch every pitch. And when, when you see what he does with the glove, that's when you're going to know what the pitcher does. If he does this, if he moves a finger, if he opens the glove from here. And I didn't know the difference between a fastball and a slider and a changeup. And that's when I first started noticing that and 
he sort of ruined me from then on because I never saw the game the same way. I always had to look and see what the pitcher was doing. And actually, it helped me out a lot moving forward in my career. So I owe a lot to Pete. That's incredible. I mean, that's incredible to think that you were thinking of that at 13 when some players aren't thinking about it at all until they get to the big dance and they're told, hey, did you see anything? And like, I don't know what you're looking at. They've just got a natural intuition, but it's different in the big leagues. Right. And Jeff, nobody's better than Eddie at finding people who are tipping and seeing things that nobody else can see. I can't tell you how many times we did a hundred games together in the booth, Eddie and I, and he would just routinely look at me and go, you see what he's doing? You see what he's doing? And I could (laughs) never see it. And he would show me the most subtle little thing, what the pitcher was doing. And he goes, watch breaking ball, watch fastball. And he was right. And that all came right, Eddie, from sitting with Pete Rose and those guys and watching the game. And watching the game, and in 1983, it helped me out a lot because, you know, I had two eyes going forward, and, you know, as we all do, but in A ball, I bunted a ball off my left eye, and I ended up having a traumatic cataract, and I had a hole in my retina, the whole thing, and that had to be lasered shut, and I had a lot of eye issues, and I couldn't get that cataract surgery back then, so I played my entire career really with my dominant eye, the left eye, without having depth reception and not being able to see clear out of it. So knowing what was coming really helped a lot. That makes sense. Eddie, it's impossible to play this game, period. You played essentially with one eye. How do you explain that? The body's a wonderful thing, but I, I, I truly believe it was 1983. He taught me what was coming, and lefties actually tip a lot more than righties because they're fastball changeup guys instead of, the righty throws a fastball slider to the right-handed hitter, and that's almost the same grip, so they keep the glove the same. So I couldn't really pick up spin. So with the changeup, that really helped. Johan Santana had one of the best changeups, but he tipped. You know, you look at Al Leiter, he was he didn't he threw a lot of hard in. So I just looked hard in the entire time. Randy Johnson, fastball slider. So I knew when the fastball was coming. So that eliminated the slider for me. That helped. So knowing what was coming really helped as far as timing. But spin-wise, good luck. Eddie, for you from a player's perspective, these players that are taking the plate or taking the field on opening day, whether it's their very first one or it's their 10th one, is there a different feeling for you? Or were you in such a rhythm that it was just another game? No, there's, there's, it's, it was never another game for me. I mean, I had butterflies before every game. I really did. And opening day was a new beginning, and you're like, okay, what's going to happen now? Um, it It was really cool. I remember there was one. It was a Sunday night game, first game of the season. Sunday night baseball had it. No other game. Everybody else started on Monday. And I was, uh, 2006, it was my last year, but I was with the then Cleveland Indians. And it was Mark Burley on the mound, and I knew he was going to be the starter. So I was like, I get opening day. With the you know with the with the Indians because uh, Ben Broussard was my platoon guy at first and I missed most of spring training because of the World Baseball Classic that year, so I didn't play during that classic. I probably only got maybe ten at bats the entire spring training, and opening day is Mark Burley and I go out and I hit a home run in my second at bat, and it's I'm like pumped up. It's the top of the fifth inning I believe, and here comes the rain. And I'm like, no way. We're going to get canceled opening day. I hit the first home run of the season. No, I led the I led the league in home runs, Tim, in 2006 <laughs> for an entire 24-hour period because there were no other games on that Sunday. It was me. And then it, then it sort of went downhill from there. But the, the cool story about it is you always, no matter if it's opening day, if it's game 160 or if it's game 78, I always had butterflies. So, Eddie, you hit a home run on opening day. because we, sa- we said earlier in the show that Johnny Bench hit 389 homers. Your hero, Johnny Bench, never hit a home run on opening day. Adrian Beltre, 477 homers, never hit a home run on opening day. And you did. Was was that your most memorable opening day? Your your first what was your first opening day as a major leaguer? My first opening day as a major leaguer was with the Angels in Minnesota 
and I was playing first base for the then California Angels. Um, I had I had come up. I had uh, uh, in '93. I had not done spring training at all with the team. Uh, I get called up midseason. Then I have elbow surgery and rehabbed real well. JT Snow was a part of the organization. They sent him down and they said, Eduardo, you're going to be the opening day first baseman. And um, I was, and it was, I was, it was unbelievable. I mean, I get to, to play with all those studs that the Minnesota Twins had in 93, and I was playing first base. It was cold as heck, too. I mean, I mean, <laughs> And I was like, how do we get to this ballpark? We were going from tunnel area to tunnel, sky bridge to sky bridge, and never set a foot outside, but just for like the last block. But man, it was it, it was a cool experience to be able to, to, to share that opening day with my teammates there. That is so cool. Eddie, tell us about the time <laughs> where <laughs> you went to spring training and and you didn't have a glove. It, would you explain to Jeffrey what you're talking about? <laughs> okay. So that was 2006. Um, I went to the World Baseball Classic. And remember, I could play first. If they needed me to play third, I had my third base glove. If they needed me to play the outfield, I had my outfield glove. I had my first base mitt. I had my backup gloves as well. I had gone to, I had gone to spring training at the beginning. I took them all because I was going to break them in. And then we go to Puerto Rico for the World Baseball Classic. And we get eliminated by Cuba. And we're staying in the same hotel, and I go over to the Cuban side, and I, I, you know, just to congratulate them, I go into their rooms, and I, you know, these guys, their gloves were just beat up, and and all this stuff, and I'm like, oh man, so I went back to my room, and I just grabbed my baseball stuff, and I said, here, guys, you need a first baseman, you need an outfield mate, you need an infielder mate, you need another first, you know, I gave them all my stuff. I get back to Winter Haven where the Indians had their spring training, and I'm asking players for, can I borrow your glove? Because I don't have a glove. And you're playing left field. Well, does anybody have an outfield glove they can lend me? And I'm playing opening day with a glove that was not mine as I was trying to break in gloves. And um, I'm telling you, man. I, that's why people ask me, they're like, how many gloves do you have in your house? I was like, I don't have any. One glove. I'm looking right here. I had a buddy of mine the other day give me one of the gloves that I gave him. And Eduardo Perez first baseman. <laughs> and then, the only reason why you have it is somebody else gave it back to you. <laughs> and, true, and true story, I'm doing therapy last year for my knee replacement that I did. And I see this high school kid. And I, I see the, all these high school kids are there. And I look to my right. And I see a Mizuno glove that has the lettering in katakana that say Perezu. And I'm looking at it, and I'm like, whose glove is that? And one of the kids goes, that's my glove, sir. And I'm like, no, it's not. I said, do you know what it says there? He goes, I have no idea. I said, well, that's your glove, and you don't know what it says? And he goes, no. I said, let me tell you what it says. It says Perezu. He goes, how do you know that? I said, because that's my glove. <laughs> like, what do you mean? And I'm like, who gave you that glove? He goes, um, you know Eli? And I'm like, who? He goes, Eli Marrero? I'm like, he stole my glove. <laughs> and then he gave it to his son, and his son then gave it to him when he was with the Cardinals back then. Gave it to him. He goes, sir, it's the best glove I've ever worn. I said, yeah, because I broke it in. That was my glove. Right. Jeff, this this is why we love Eddie. He's a freaking Major League Baseball player, and he laughs at himself more than anyone. <laughs> Eddie, when your dad, we, we love your dad. Your dad loves you. You love your dad. Please, just tell us what happened when you called your Hall of Fame father to tell him that you were going to the big leagues. <laughs> um, when I was going to the big leagues? Yes. So I called For the, the first the, time. I, I, go, um, I go, Dad. I'm in Scottsdale, Arizona, and I just get news, and I call him right away, and I go, Dad, I just got called up to the big leagues. And he goes, why? <laughs> and I'm like, what do you mean why? Instead of being all excited, he goes, you're not ready. I'm like, what do you mean I'm not ready? I'm like, I've been raking down here. He goes, all right, all right, go get him. You know, it was because he knew, uh, you know, what it took to get up there and to be able to stay at the big leagues. And he always told me, he said, look, it's really easy to get to the big leagues. It's hard to stay. And it took me a while to understand that. 
but it was an up and down career that I had in my 20s, trying to stay in the big leagues and not looking over my shoulder every day, wondering if this was going to be my last day or last opportunity or last at bat. And that was stressful, but I, then I understood it. I wasn't ready defensively. I just moved to third base, and he knew that there was a lot more to go. He knew that I was ready when it came to base running because I, he, he saw me run the bases, and he knew that I was very instinctual when it, come to that, when it came to that. And hitting-wise, he knew that I needed a lot of work. But I was ecstatic that I made it to the big leagues because, remember, in A-ball, I had lost a lot of my eyesight in my left eye so just getting there for me was an accomplishment. Well, Eddie, I think this is a great statistic for you to be reminded how rare it is to even have one at bat in major in Major League Baseball. Only just just a little over twenty thousand people in the history of baseball have ever thrown a pitch or had an at bat in a major league ballpark in a game. Now, to put that in perspective, the smallest ballpark is Progressive Field in Cleveland. If you put every player in the history of baseball, 150-odd years, into that stadium, we wouldn't even be 75% full. And that's the entire stadium, the smallest stadium. You put every player who ever had a moment to play Major League Baseball, we're not even 75% capacity. So you talk about staying in the Major Leagues, but getting there in the first place is an accomplishment in itself. That's why it's such a big deal to play in the bigs. And you're 100% right, and I appreciate you telling me that because every year I do the Rookie Development Program, and that's a, a program that Major League Baseball and the Players Association, they agree on. They, they get it right, and I'm fortunate to MC it, and I usually tell them how hard and privileged, how, how privileged they should be to even be in this program and how some of them um, have already been to the big leagues and some are about to get there. So those numbers continue to rise, but not at a high, not at a quick level, and it's uh, that's that's really impressive. I appreciate you telling me that because I'm going to steal that from you. Right, Eddie. This is a relationship show. It's me and Jeff, father and son. What was it like for you to drive home after a game, a major league game with your father? What what was that like? What was the discussion when you drove home after a game with your dad? You know what's interesting, Tim. I don't know any other thing but that. And to me, just to, to grow up and, okay, let's wait for dad. And let, let's start at the, let's start at the, uh, right when the game's over. And I was allowed in the clubhouse when they won. That was important. It was, I love the part that they won because the first thing that I would do is go straight to the keg as a kid and <laughs> prepare. To the keg? Oh, yeah. And then I would, I learned how to, I'm telling you, out of a tap as a, I want to say maybe as a seven or eight year old, I knew how to be able to, to get that beer without a lot of foam on it, you know, just perfect because that was my dad. I got that old beer for him right there after the game. That's what I love to do after games. I never told you this on air, did I? I love but, that. Yeah. So it was, and then later on in his career, when he started uh, coaching and everything, it was Buddy Bell, Ron Oster the same way. And I was like, I got this boys. I got it. And I would fill out the pitcher and then I'd, Pour some of the beer. Good game, guys. Um, but after the game, it was just, it was us. It was normal. My dad, as soon as he left the ballpark, never really talked about the game. It was like, how was your day? It would, more, it would be more about my mom. It would be more about, okay, so so what did you do today that, that you know, that we need to know about or, or conversations that had really nothing to do with the game unless my brother or I would ask him about, hey, Dad, this situation, uh, what, what happened here? Or the umpire made a bad call, and he's like, he actually didn't, and he would explain that to us. Mm. But those were the conversations we would have. The only thing I wish we would have had is the technology that we have today where we could watch games um, on the West Coast and be able to sit and watch those together. I would never got that opportunity because technology was not there in the 70s and 80s. But – just to be able to listen to the radio to Marty and Joe, uh, Marty Brenneman and Joe Nexoff when he would call on the road, because that's what we had. It was rare that games were televised. Then I would ask him about, okay, can you take me through this at bat? Was that pitch really that bad that you got called out on strike three? Talk to me about the home run. Those were the things I wanted to know. Right. Eddie, tell us the story about the, the first uniform number that you were given when you went to the big leagues. 
Okay, so I was given uh, my first big league number was actually, I want to say, 21. And it was 21. I get called up. I see 21 in my locker, and I'm like, ooh. I'm like, man, that's that's Roberto Clemente. Um, I grew up in Puerto Rico. I, you know, Clemente carried me. And I, we grew up knowing the history of Clemente. I, I did clinics, and I, and I took clinics at Roberto Clemente Sports City. I was like, this number is just way too heavy for me. Um, I had a home run that game with that uniform number, but I didn't want to wear it. I thought I wasn't worthy of wearing number 21. I thought, you know, and today there's a lot of young young players that, that want to wear it because it, it's, it's a prideful thing. But I thought it was just like we see Jackie's number right now in 42, that it's just uh, too big to wear. And to me, Clemente's number was just too big to wear. And then from 21, I ended up uh, wearing, uh, I, I went then from, from uh, 21 to 24. So, Eddie, I know if I'm doing my math right, you might have been three years old when Roberto Clemente passed away. Is that correct? May, may, around uh, there? Really yeah. young. So you might not exactly remember what that moment was like, but as you spoke, I mean, you remember the impact he had on the game where you were growing up, right? How massive was that? Well, the impact that you got to give credit to, uh, Doña Vera Clemente, who passed away, and, and to the Clemente family, but she took on the uh, she took on the role to make sure that people wouldn't forget who he was and to mm. teach. So our schools teach us in Puerto Rico who Roberto Clemente is. I lived in Ca I live in Carolina in Puerto Rico. I grew up in Carolina. My wife is from Carolina. We know who Roberto Clemente is. I look around here and I've got a lot of Clemente stuff here as well. Uh, it's just. It's uh, to us. It's 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 a pride thing in in understanding that it wasn't just about what he did on the field. And yeah, there's a lot of what he did on the field, but what he did off the field and what he meant to the players, to the communities in in Latin America was huge. And dying the way he did after an earthquake in Nicaragua, um, it just told you how selfless he was. Yeah, and, and, you know, speaking of the recent election or, or soon-to-be election or the announcement of who's going to get elected this year, he's the only player to to have the mandatory five-year waiting period waived because of, obviously, his tragic death, but his impact not only on baseball but also on community, and that's why we have a, an award named after him. He was that big and that impactful on the game and the communities he served. And, and the, the curious thing, and Tim, you know this, I mean, we had Rick Sutcliffe as one of our partners, and I imagine he might be hitting cleanup in, your next show, in one of your next shows or something, but he's, he'll tell you, he's won Cy Young's. His, his award that he's the most proud of is the Roberto Clemente Award. Same thing can be said with Albert wow. Pujols. The same thing can be said with so many others that have won this award. I just saw Aaron Judge this year in Arizona uh, get the award, and he was humbled by it. And this is another man that has won the, the MVP award. So people understand that when you start making a difference in communities, it says a lot more about you than just having the extraordinary ability of hitting a ball and catching a ball. <clears throat> well, I'm old enough to have seen Roberto Clemente play. I saw him in person spring training of 1972 in Washington. And all I wanted to do was see two things. I needed to watch him throw from right field to third base, and the play came. It was breathtaking. And the only other thing I needed to see was one of those rocket line drives to right field, and he hit one of those. So I went to see him play in person when I was 15 years old. Oh, and I went home saying, oh, my gosh, I saw him, and I'm sorry, Eddie. I'll never forget my father walking down the stairs that morning on – New Year's Day, with tears in his eyes, my dad loved the game, loved the game, and understood the game, and he was crying, and I said, Pop, what's wrong? And he told me that Roberto Clemente had died in a plane crash. Those are the things you never forget, whether you're 15 or 55. Yeah. 
Eddie, for you, before we let you go, and we can't thank you enough for joining the podcast and being our very first guest, I could, we couldn't have asked for a better first guest. I mean, before I had the opportunity to call the celebrity softball game with my dad, I did it with Eduardo Perez, thanks to his convincing of those at ESPN. Once again, Dad, I love you, but this man is my number one supporter and fan here. <laughs> He's the one getting me places in this career. But, Eddie, I, <laughs> I just want to know... Looking ahead in the 2024 baseball season, before we let you go to end on a positive, what is, just give me one thing, one team, one player, whatever it is, what is your one thing you're looking forward to in this season to see? Okay, so I'm not going to go to L.A. because everybody is going right, that right. way. I'm not going there. But I'm going to go with the ultimate team, and it's, I'm going to go with the division, and it's the American League East. I still have mm. to stay with the Beast. Look. The story of the Baltimore Orioles and now with the ownership selling, I think it's a huge story. It's a huge story because you have a lot of young players that are coming up that organization, and now Cal Ripken is going to be a part of that ownership. And I'm, I, I would not be dismissed at all if we see some multi-year contracts coming up for these young players to lock them up as Orioles. Number two, I am so curious to find out exactly what's going to go on in in, um, in New York, I want Aaron Judge to be healthy from day one to game 162. And I want to see if he can play center field every day. I really doubt it. I think he's a be- I think he should stick to the corners, and I think Juan Soto should stick to the corners. And I want to see what that duo can do. Um, Baseball is better when, when, when the Yankees are involved in it. That's the reality. And then I'm curious to find out how, how, the, how the rest of that division – how that rest of the division, including the Toronto Blue Jays, how they're going to be able to continue to keep that window open. Because this is their window time, but the Orioles have gotten better, and I think the Yankees are going to be a team to be dealt with in this division again. And I think Aaron Boone, who managed brilliantly last year, um, I think is going to be even better this year with the likes of Soto and Judge. All right, well, Eddie... We got to let Eddie go, Jeff. Okay, he has to go catch a plane. It leaves in twenty minutes, and he's got a, <laughs> and he's he got a left his house minute yet. ride to the airport. <laughs> well, everybody, Eduardo Perez, thank you for joining. Is this a great game or what? With Tim and Jeff Kirkshin, we are huge fans of you. We consider you family. You're one of the Kirkshins, so thank you so much for being our very first guest. We appreciate it. And, and thank you so much for having me be that first guest. I mean, I think the world of the Kirchin family. And um, whenever I want, as soon as Tim called, I picked up and I'm like, of course I'm going to do this. And Mirba <laughs> looked at me, she goes, I mean, why wouldn't you? Of course you're going to do this. So I was like, just let me know when and I'll be there. So well, hopefully I'm, I'm leading off. This is great. My Facebook chat is just kicking <laughs> Tell Mirva and the girls we said hi. Thank you, Eddie. You got it. Thank you. A big thank you to Eduardo Perez for joining us and being our very first guest (laughs) on Is This a Great Game or What? We're going to be with you every single week. This is obviously our opening day episode, so go celebrate. Cheer on your team. Got an exciting season of Major League Baseball ahead. But before we wrap today, I have one question who is Kent Herbeck? All right, Kent. And why did he nail his cup <laughs> to the wall of his garage? All right, he is the most human baseball player that I've ever met. He he was a really good first baseman of the Twins, won a world championship in 87 and 91, and they used to always joke that in the big team party before a playoff series began in Minneapolis, Ken Herbeck was like the only Twins player to go because the beer was was free. That's who Ken Herbeck was. He was just like us, only he was a really good baseball player. And famously, he went to a camp out once with Andy Van Slyke, another former player from a million years ago. And Andy told me that Ken Herbeck brought a tape recording of his favorite farts to play around the camp. <laughs> yeah, to play around the campsite at the big campfire on the as they went camping. Uh, Typical, classic Kent Herbeck. Oh, my gosh. I mean, listen, the garage is the only room I'm allowed to, <laughs> to decorate in my house. But if I then added on the tapes of my farts, I would no longer be married. Agreed. Me too. Is this a great game or what? Every week with Tim Kirkshin and Jeff Kirkshin. 
thank you. Don't forget to subscribe. Check out our website, greatgameorwhat.com, to follow us on all the social media. And you can also check out all of the episodes on YouTube because we're doing the video thing. Go check us out, greatgameorwhat.com.